Hi, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the New America Foundation. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us for the afternoon's event um, called Mobile Disconnect. Can mobile solutions really combat global poverty? My name is Jamie Zimmerman, and I'm the director of the Global Assets Project here at New America, a co-host of this event, along with our Open Technology Initiative um, and its director, Sasha Meinroth. So I've been really excited about today's event um, and so thrilled to see a packed house, um, a lot of people in the room that are friends and colleagues um, looking around for what I can tell. And, and, I, and what I'm hoping is going to be um, a lot of great uh, energy uh, today for this, I think, really amazing panel and a topic that I think is really important. Um, so important that I'm actually taking a 15 minute break um, to come to this event uh, from my maternity leave uh, today. <laughs> and there, if you see a three week old baby ro roaming the halls of the New America Foundation, that is my son. And uh, he may be the youngest person to ever attend an event at the New America Foundation. Um, though I don't know, Sasha, maybe your little girl was here <laughs> early on too. She, yeah, pretty close. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I'm really excited to be here. Um, the event has been a while in the making and stems from a number of conversations and observations over the last few months, um, even longer, on how mobile solutions and the role of technology broadly uh, can spur innovation that will accelerate poverty reduction globally. Over the last few years, there's been this explosion of interest in mobile solutions. Um, we hear everything from M -health, mobile health, M health, uh, health, M government, M women, um, particularly M money or mobile money, uh, all this related to uh, that related to financial inclusion, um, which has been a particular interest to the Global Assets Project, um, which is uh, the the program here in New America that that I run. And just last year. Uh, our policy analyst within the Global Assets Project, Jamie Holmes and myself, wrote a an article on the mobile money revolution uh, and its potentially powerful impacts on both uh, increasing the effectiveness and the efficiency of financial empowerment efforts around the globe. And so, you know, since that time and you know, and thereafter, everywhere I turn, there is some sort of paper or event or new initiative or a conference on mobile solutions, on ICT for D, um, or uh, uh, information communication technology for development. I th probably everybody knows this acronym, but just in case. Uh, just yesterday morning, even, there was a White House event on innovation and global development that looked in part at mobile issues and mobile innovation. Uh, but with all this buzz and excitement, you know, I was also, at the same time, I've been having numerous conversations with others that are actually deep in the trenches of ICT for D, um, such as my colleague, Sasha, uh, who's going to be talking with all of you today, but many others who are, who've been cautioning me and saying, you know, don't get, don't get so caught up in the hype. You know, there's still a lot that needs to be done. You know, there's so much that's happening that's not really having and maybe won't even, will never have the impact that people say that it's going to have. You know, this, there's a, a, a lot of buzz around this, but, you know, let's be, let's actually talk about this, you know, in, in a little bit more of a, a serious way. Um, and so, you know, with both of these, you know, both sides of this coming together, a lot of excitement, but then also others, you know, kind of saying, whoa, kind of look, let's, let's get, you know, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. It kind of got me thinking, you know, is the global development field looking at technology, innovation, uh, and its relationship with global development realistically? <coughs> Uh, or are we getting caught up in the promise of innovation without considering some of the very real challenges and limitations um, presented with it? So between the hope and the hype, where do mobile solutions really stand? Uh, what is the real promise of these tools and what will it take to actually fulfill that promise? These are the questions that you know, have been burning for me and in my mind and, and, uh, and the impetus for this event today. So. Um, as most, a lot of you probably saw on the screen before the event, you saw that map. There was a map that was being displayed in some in a video with it, uh, which was just published today on uh, Slate, um, the Slate.com, the the website for Slate Magazine, through a new partnership that we've started with them called Map of the Week. And what that map showed um, is mobile penetration levels worldwide. So how mobile is far outpacing fixed land fixed line phones almost everywhere um, in the world, but also how limited access remains in many parts of the developing world. Um, so 
you know, what this reminds us is that, you know, despite this amazing pace of growth, and there are estimates ranging between now five to six billion cell phone subscriptions worldwide, and up to 87 percent global mobile penetration, um, that there is still a really great digital divide. Um, you know, I think even more telling is if we look at mobile access within countries and the growing connectivity divide between the haves and have-nots, the actual populations within those countries, which I believe is often ignored um, in global development circles, um, and particularly among those of us who get so excited about that six billion number and that 87 percent number, and we think, you know, wow, the, you know, we're we're at scale, we're we're gonna we're totally included, and we're achieving this, but when you really look at the look at the statistics, we're still a ways off, um, and. This is the topic of an article that Sasha and I uh, published just today, also in conjunction with the map, um, uh, the map of the week on Slate, uh, where we argue that what we really need is a radical shift in thinking around ICT for D and how to address this digital divide. And our argument, basically, and I'll just talk about it really quickly in, in this article, is that you know we really feel that we need to find more practical and appropriate solutions to support truly universal, low-cost mobile connectivity and ensure that the poorest households are able to truly harness the power of mobile connectivity uh, in the way that we are arguing, the rest of us are arguing that you know, they will in, in some, at you know, some point in the near future be able to do. So we look specifically at the case of mobile money in this, in this article and argue that these services are not effectively reaching the poorest of the poor. In a 2010 study of M-Pesa in Kenya, which I'm sure many of you know about, this mobile money service in Kenya that's you know, probably the, the most well-known in the world, where mobile money penetration is greatest um, globally, 60% of the poorest quartile of the population does not use the service. Um, and another, I think even more telling, a report by Research ICT Africa looked at income expenditures of 17 African countries and found that many of the poorest individuals studied were spending over 16 percent of their total income on mobile services. So access and cost are big parts of the problem, despite the fact that technologies to dramatically lower the cost of connectivity do exist today. Um, but the bigger picture issue at stake, I think, in the case of mobile connectivity is that in what we argue in our in our article is that a rising tide does not lift all boats. Uh, as more people use and benefit from mobile services, the divide between those who have access to it and those who adopt it and those who don't will grow exponentially, creating a greater economic divide, leaving the poor further and further behind. So for all its promise, which I do very much believe in and I'm a and I am an advocate of mobile solutions and, and mobile money, uh, I think that there are very real risks to how we harness and apply the apply new technologies to spur global development innovations uh, and we think this warrants serious consideration. Uh, so that's our take on it um, but I think this is a complex and dynamic sort of issue and it's really ripe for debate uh, which is why we're here today to ponder the question can mobile solutions really combat global poverty? If yes how? When and under what context? If not why not? Um, what's standing in the way? And I think we got a jump start on this debate earlier in the week uh, on the Global Innovation Showcase on CNN.com slash innovation. Um, the Global Innovation Showcase is a partnership between uh, the uh, CNN's GPS and New America Foundation's Global Assets Project. And we asked our panelists uh, the question, are mobile solutions overhyped? And very interestingly to me, even among our experts, uh, there aren't really clear answers. I think there was one resounding yes, they're overhyped. Um, and two other uh, commentators said yes and no, literally said yes and no. And then another said it depends. So the jury is obviously still out uh, on this question, on the issue. Um, and I think this is only the beginning um, of a much longer conversation that will continue to shift and evolve and evolve. And so I'm thrilled that we get the opportunity uh, to continue that conversation in person today with such an amazing group of panelists. So I'm going to introduce them to you. But before I do that, I'm just going to say a couple words about today's event structure. The panelists are going to come up um, as well as our moderator and make short presentations on their view of this issue. Um, and then we're going to have a moderated debate before we open it up um, to Q&A among the audience and I hope that we have plenty of time for a nice discussion with with all of you um, when you ask your questions and I just say this at every event because I think it needs 
repeating at every event. Please wait for the microphone and speak directly into it because we do webcast live all of our events. And if you're not speaking into that microphone, those who are watching over webcast can't hear a word that you're saying. Um, so if you could just, you know, hope we'll have people running microphones, if you could just wait. Um, and then when you get that microphone, speak directly into it, state your name and affiliation if you can remember to do so. And please, please, please keep your question to a question and just one question at that, please. Um, I know that you won't follow that, but I just thought I'd say it anyway. Uh, um, for the Twitter crowd in the room and online, uh, you can tweet about or follow today's discussion on Twitter um, by following our events hashtag MDisconnect. And um, finally, for those wanting to continue the conversation after the formal panel ends, I hear that there is a gathering over at Circle Bistro um, over in Washington Circle as part of the cleverly named ICT for Drinks event series. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce this panel to you today. Um, and I think that this just might be the, you know, par for the course with the ICT 4D innovation tech crowd. Um, but I think this might be one of the coolest groups of people that I've ever convened for an event. So I'm going to start with our moderator, Sasha Meinroth. He's the director of the New, of New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative and has been described as a, quote, community internet pioneer and a, quote, entrepreneurial visionary, which I think is pretty cool. So... Um, he's a well-known expert on community wireless networks, municipal broadband, and telecommunications policy. In 2009, he was named one of Ars Technica's Tech Policy's People to Watch, and also in 2009, he was a recipient of the Public Knowledge IP3 Award for Excellence in Public Interest Advocacy. He's the co-founder of Measurement Lab, which is a distributed server platform for researchers around the world to deploy internet measurement tools, advance network research, and empower the public with useful information about their broadband connections. He also coordinates the Open Source Wireless Coalition, a global partnership of open source wireless integrators, researchers, implementers, and companies dedicated to the development of open source interoperable low-cost wireless technologies. Also very cool. Um, next is Maura O'Neill, who's the Chief Innovation Officer and Senior Counselor to the Administrator of USAID, the US Agency for International Development. In the public, private, and academic sectors, Mora has focused on sustainable energy developments, as well as entrepreneurship and innovation. And before coming to USAID, she served as a Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor in the US Department of Agriculture, as well as Chief of Staff for US Senator Maria Cantwell. Mara has started four companies in the energy, education, and high technology areas and was once named the Greater Seattle Business Person of the Year. Mara also completed her PhD at Wa University of Washington where her discovery research, and I think this is really cool, though the rest of it is also really cool, but I thought this was particularly cool, was on how narrow-mindedness occurs and the er errors it leads in decision-making, which is really interesting. Uh, the next, and I think we're going to switch these name tags around, but the next uh, speaker is going to be Katrine Verklaas. Katrine is the co-founder and editor of mobileactive.org, a global network of practitioners using mobile phones for social impact. Katrine is currently working on mobile projects in good governance and accountability and political participation in emerging democracies. She's also leading a team focused on mobile security tools for human rights defenders in repressive regimes. A native of Germany, she has written widely on mobile phones for organizing, advocacy, and civ citizen participation for civil society organizations. She previously led several nonprofit organizations, such as the Nonprofit Technology Network, the National Association of IT Professionals working in more than one million nonprofit organizations in the United States. She's also the editor of Managing Technology to Meet Your Mission. And in 2000, she was a 2009 TED Fellow and a 2010 Fellow at MIT Media Lab and was named by Fast Company as one of the most, quote, influential women in tech in 2011. Also very cool. So next, on, next down the line is Michael Tarazi, a senior policy specialist at CGAP, the consultative group to assist the poor out of the World Bank. Michael joined CGAP in 2008 as a member of their government and policy team, and he leads the team's efforts in the area of branchless banking regulation and has worked with regulators around the world to develop regulatory frameworks, such as the Maldives, Nigeria, Rwanda, Fiji, Haiti, and Jordan. He's the co-author of uh, Non-Bank E-Money Issuers, Regulatory Approaches to Protecting Customer Deposits, and Islamic Microfinance, an Emerging Market Niche. 
Michael teaches courses on branchless banking at the Boulder Institute of Microfinance, and he was chosen as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and is a member of the forum's dialogue series on access to finance through technology. Prior to joining CGAP, he was a corporate attorney in a private practice and served as the European General Counsel for a mysteriously unnamed U.S. company, I noticed <laughs> in your bio, unnamed U.S. company providing finance-related technological services to developing countries. And he also, after all that and within all that, served as an advisor to the Israeli-Palestine peace negotiations. And last but not least is Kintaro Toyama, a visiting researcher in the School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's working on a book arguing that increasing human wisdom should be the primary focus in international development activities. I wonder if we'll hear more about that today. And until 2009, Kintaro was Assistant Managing Director of Microsoft Research India, which he co-founded in 2005. And at MSR India, he started the Technology for Emerging Markets Research Group, which conducts interdisciplinary research to understand how the world's poorest communities interact with electronic technology uh, and to invent new ways for technology to support their so socioeconomic development. The group is known for uh, such award-winning projects as Multipoint, Text-Free User Interfaces, and Digital Green. Kintaro also co-founded the IEEE ACM International Conference on Information and Communication Technologies and Development to provide a global platform for rigorous academic research in this field. And prior to his time in India, Kintaro did computer vision and multimedia research at Microsoft Research in the United States, the UK, and has also taught university mathematics in Ghana on top of all of that. So um, a very uh, experienced, diverse crowd, and I'm really, uh, really excited about the panel today and the diversity of views that I think uh, will emerge in the discussion that we have. So thank you very much to our four panelists and our moderator um, for coming together today to share your thoughts and experiences. Thank you to Sasha and OTI for co-hosting the event with the Global Assets Project. Um, thanks to my team within the Global Assets Project for putting this all together while I've been MIA for the last three weeks. And um, thanks to all of you in the room uh, for being here and for those of us joining online. Uh, you know, hope that uh, to en you enjoy your participation as well. So thanks for joining us and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. You guys come on up. I've got a list here so all right. Yes. So while folks do a little dance there, I'll just say, you know, it's it's really great. That's true. Yeah, there's a couple seats out front if anyone's standing there wondering where they're going to sit. But it's really great to to be here. Um you know, I may be the geekery behind a lot of New America's work. Uh but Jamie's really the brains behind a lot of the global assets and community building facets of this. And if we've got geeks and brains, then these folks right here, they're the visionaries that are thinking about big fixes, big ideas, the future of this entire sector. And um, when I think about sort of uh, the groupings of, of people that think about and talk about the future of mobile communications, I sort of break them down into another false dichotomy, which is this. You know, you have sort of a lot of people that sort of have this techno-deterministic, super utopian, you know, this technology will save us all mentality. And then it seems like you flip almost directly from that into sort of the super cynical, dismissive, Luddite-esque kind of thought structure that says, you know, these things are evil and should be, you know, ex excluded from civil society as quickly as possible. And my hope is that today we're going to tread an honest assessment that marks out kind of the boundaries of these two straw men and thinks about sort of the realities that we face, the knowledge that we've gained as we've garnered experience in these areas. And a lot of the work that I and the Open Technology Initiative team do is really focused on, you know, where do the realities of these technologies, the actual potential implications and impacts on local communities lie? How do we get beyond all of the marketing and PR shenanigans that we are faced with in this 
and actually learn about what's possible. And these four panelists know this through and through. And so my hope is, and I'm going to be scribbling maniacally over here on the podium as they talk, to think about sort of the questions and follow-ups to get a conversation started. I think this is probably the most important issue facing civil society and participatory democracy. How we communicate in the future is absolutely fundamental to the future of civilization. And with that in mind, I think the work that these people are doing really arises as one of the most fundamentally important sectors on Earth. The questions that these people are, are grappling with and the answers that they are providing really fundamentally affect the very future of society. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Maura, who's going to talk a little bit about her work and her experiences helping le lead USAID's work in this area. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, so much, Sasha. And I was thrilled to read the blogs. I was thrilled to have Jamie be so provocative, because I actually think that sort of mashup, along with the panel's um, ideas in just a minute, will help us, inform us to get to a better place, even if we don't uh, um, always uh, agree. So um, I will tell you just quickly that USAID has uh, um, very heavily into the uh, to the mobile revolution. We have a mobile solutions group, but also decentralized. We are, well, I was the one that said it depends. The only reason I said it depends on whether this mobile is overhyped is if you're taking a snapshot right now and say, the second you put that mobile phone in somebody's hands, does their health, education, or welfare outcome or, or civil society switch? And of course, I would say no. But I think that that's a wrong question to ask. I say, are we on a trajectory to actually have it be a poverty eradication and to help create a more fair and just world, and I am completely bullish. I'll give you some examples of, of uh, where I come from on that and then quickly hit on adoption, access, affordability, and apps, but more broadly, um, what can people do with it and how does how is it really going to matter? So. Um, I actually um, was in the lived in the pre-PC world, and I remember when computers started showing up in government and corporations, and the managers said, "Oh, that's ridiculous! They have a dumb terminal to a mainframe. Why would you need a PC? My employees are just going to play with it. It isn't going to improve productivity." And so I feel like some of the naysayers around mobiles are sort of um, similar um, to that. Um, with all due respect to my panelists who are um, as smart or smarter than me and will challenge me on this point. So I get it. I'm just supposed to be provocative, so I will start by doing that. Um, the second thing is on um, on email and internet. So email was started really as a messaging system for the military, is trying to figure out how in battlefield and difficult conditions they could get messages out. And it morphed into uh, the internet with a lot of people saying, same thing in what I would call Web 1.0. People, lots of articles, including on uh, about Amazon, that it was going to be a bust, that this is ridiculous. And certainly if you look at uh, uh, where Alta Vista and some of the search engines came, they quickly became sort of massively unusable because they didn't have smart algorithms that really could connect to our brain and tell us where we really want to go. So this is by way of saying I think we are at Mobiles for Development 1.0. Um, and so it's not that I don't think that 2.0 and 3.0 won't make a huge difference, but I'm completely bullish on this being revolutionary in terms of the ability to impact uh, poverty and to make this a more just and fair world. So let me just uh, touch on four points really quickly. Adoption rates. It is absolutely true that there are gaps in adoption rates, and I really think that the work that Sasha and Jamie did to say, hey, let's get real about who's actually owning owning these phones and uh, and where is really important and we ought to pay attention. So USAID along with the Cherie Blair Foundation and GSM realize there is a huge gap with respect to women at the bottom of the pyramid owning cell phones. So did an analysis that said 300 million more less women 
own mobile phones than men. And we decided to partner globally to see if in three years we could cut that in half. And we realized we needed to cut it in half with a market-based approach, not by just giving the phones to poor women or giving them calling uh, top of cards to be able to use it, but rather to work with the mobile operators to build the business case for why would you um, target poor women and how could they become um, part of this. And we think that without that diligence to the bottom of the pyramid and to gender and to some other gaps, it, that it could actually, the mobile revolution could actually exacerbate problems. So hats off to people uh, like New America who's bringing attention to where that's happening. The second thing is access. We see pretty dramatic differences in, in uh, access. That's just, you know, not surprising that in places like the um, Democratic Republic of Congo or Sudan, they have incredibly low, um, or even Ethiopia has low penetration rates of mobile. So we got to pay attention to, oh, I have to speak up? Ah, okay. Um, okay, I'll talk louder. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to have to figure out on access and we're going to have to monitor that as well is that it's fine to say it's 86 percent but in fact it's not ubiquitous around the world and in some of the poorest places it's particularly bad so we're going to have to look at access the next one is we're going to have to look at affordability and uh, i know that uh, the state department is thinking about uh, partnering with a number of people to think about could we actually figure out how to have breakthroughs with respect to affordability. We know that actually there are a number of poor countries around the world where internet access is three times as more expensive than the U.S. and it ain't cheap in the U.S. as well. So we got to work on um, adoption rates we got for special groups. We got to work on access. We got to work on affordability. And the last one is we got to say, is there something useful you could do with this mobile phone um, besides listen to music and talk to each other, which is hugely valuable, but in terms of, of uh, bottom of the pyramid kind of uh, changes to poverty. So on that, I'll say that there's some really encouraging stats. Um, I know some of my... Um, uh, panelists will talk about mobile money. We think it is a game-changing development imperative across all applications, across all outcomes. Um, but I'll give you a couple statistics. In Afghanistan, about uh, half the civil servants, which are most of the um, uh, military and police uh, get paid in cash. Um, when we funded a pilot to pay them through their mobile phone, they thought they immediately got a 30% raise. They thought they got it from the cell phone company. But that was actually not a 30% raise. They were for the first time getting paid what they were actually supposed to be paid. There was just a few sticky fingers along the way when it was cash. Now we think that it has huge ability to actually put money where it should be in terms of salaries, in cash for work, in, uh, in uh, civil servants, as well as others, in terms of farmers, uh, reducing the middlemen um, that are taking some of it as they are selling their crops or buying their inputs. So we think mobile money, there's clearly examples. We know that there's 500,000 bank branches around the world, and there's five or six billion phones. And so we know with M-Pesa, well, not every statistic is fantastic. We see a dramatic rise in financial inclusion. We see a dramatic rise in the number of people who have access to mobile phones and their ability to store money for the first time. And we know from our M Women research that women uh, are really excited about the ability to control their own money, which is a nice way of saying hide their money from their uh, spouses or their family members who want to steal it. And it's a lot easier to hi uh, hide a SIM card than uh, cash, so we're excited. A couple others in mobile health, we're showing in Bangladesh some research that we will, or some impact evaluation data that we will publish shortly on what happens when you send an SMS uh, regularly to moms that are pregnant. Do they have healthier babies? Do they, do they die less often? Do they seek more help? And I'll give you a preview. We're really excited about uh, what that uh, data is showing. So in 
Closing, I'm completely bullish on mobiles for development. That doesn't mean we should just close our eyes and hope all good things will happen in civil society and health and money and in access. But I think that uh, we should embrace it fully and understand that this mobiles for D1.0 is this crazy experimental phase where we're trying to find out, just like we were at the beginning of the App Store, as the beginning of uh, the computer, where are those killer apps that will help raise the fortunes of people around the world to realize their full potential? So thank you, Sasha. Brilliant. Thank you, Mara. So buy ICT 4D stock immediately <laughs> <laughs> is the take-home message. Just buy message. it in a portfolio basis <laughs> because some of them will fail pretty spectacularly. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. So if we can bring up the first PowerPoint or presentation, I think, Katrine, you're going to go next. Do you need this laser yeah, I device? Yeah, Um, so thanks, New America Foundation, Jamie, and everybody. Um, thanks, everybody who's listening online from the Twitter stream. It sounds like there's quite a number. And we are on the panel rudely, I am anyway, watching the Twitter stream. So I hope that there will be some provocation from there as well. So I've been in this field for a fairly long time. Um, 2005, we didn't even talk about M4D at that point. That term didn't exist. And I was bullish at the time as well. I was extremely exciting look, excited looking at the growth of mobile technology and the penetration rates that were happening in developing countries or the growth rates that were happening in developing countries. And so I was probably one of the people in uh, answer to Kawanja's question online, um, who did the hyping? I think today it's the donors, it's the development agencies who are doing a lot of the hyping um, of mobile for development. Um, and uh, I want to step back for a second and actually remind us that mobile phones did not have, they weren't aimed at development, right? Mobile technology and the need to communicate or let's put it this way, the need to communicate and talk to one another is a very human need. And so the growth rates that you're seeing um, around the world are a direct result, not because of for development purposes or anti-poverty reasons, it's because people want to talk to one another. They want to consume um, entertainment, information, whatever it is, uh, social connection, cohesion, um, via and with their phones. And these are affordable and fairly usable devices. So. You know, the, the, the growth happened despite, or certainly not because, uh, of development issues. Um, so the two areas where I, you know, have been sort of paying some attention, have been excited about in the past, and I'll fast forward to where I am today in a moment, um, is the area of agriculture, certainly, M agriculture, and uh, particularly the work that um, people like Jenny Aker have been doing in looking at, um, uh, streamlining markets and making markets more efficient via access to information um, with mobile technology, access to market prices, um, the ability to bring, to actually charge prices that are more in line uh, with, the, with the environment around, the ability to access information um, for, for, to streamline markets really has been beneficial and there's a significant amount of data, growing up, um, amount of data in Kintaro. I hope you'll speak to that uh, maybe a little bit. Um, the other area, certainly um, this is a picture from UNICEF, is in the area of health, um, health data collection, patient management. There, there are certainly M Health is a huge growth factor. If you buy stock, buy it in M Health. Um, you know, everybody's jumping on that bat bandwagon the world over, including this country, um, uh, disease management, et cetera. Uh, you know, enormous potential. I think some of the data is missing, so I'm looking very much forward to seeing what USAID is putting out as to whether helping patients or uh, managing patients, uh, providing services via mobile technology actually includes better health outcomes. I'd like to see some really substantive data, but certainly there's a lot of activity there, and the, the ability to gather data is, is quite substantial. Um, you know, things like uh, the work that UNICEF doing, is doing, for example, in Zambia and Tanzania uh, for the first time having birth and beth, death registries, which are important to look at kind of longitudinally what, you know, do, are we actually achieving different health outcomes. So they are helping the, the Tanzanian and Z Zambian governments to actually have reliable birth and death data mostly collected via mobile technology. 
Um, we are also seeing that mobile phones are becoming increasingly sophisticated. This is a very low cost or relatively low cost phone from India uh, running Android. The price of hardware, as it were, as we know from many a law, uh, is coming down and the functionality is increasing. So if you look at recent smartphone sales have been increasing despite our, our in, in in quantities much larger than expected. And so globally, um, we are seeing you know, smartphone rates increasing that allow uh, people to do a hell of a lot more than a simple phone that just runs phone and SMS uh, would allow us to do. Um, that also, of course, on the flip side, um, what you have been alluding to may lead us to a mobile digital divide, right? It's people who cannot read, who cannot afford, uh, the latest and greatest, even if it's only a $40 Android smartphone, um, that have access to services or don't have access to services on very simple phones that other people do, who are able to afford, you know, the sort of the next generation of phones. Um, the work that I've been doing has obviously been particularly focused on democratic participation and, and I think we've seen the role of mobile technology in documenting and organizing and reporting in the recent revolutions. This is a picture actually that I took in Cairo um, and you see, you know, you see the plethora of mobile phones there um, that you know, wherever you go, there are phones everywhere and people will immediately record and to some extent, you know, thanks to the very organized and very smart reporting from people from Syria, we actually have a ton of information there, sat phones in, in part, um, from there when traditional media is not, is not having access. So this is the kind of stuff that I get excited about now at this point because I think there are some significant challenges and problems and where we're ne really needing to look at a much more nuanced and balanced um, view. I don't know whether you're all familiar with the hype cycle. It's actually a slide that I usually have and I didn't for some reason include, but Gartner a long time ago um, d uh, developed this sort of simple but conceptually compelling um, hype cycle. Look it up, it's in the Wikipedia. Um, essentially, it has a technology trigger, it doesn't matter what it is, let's just call it a mobile phone. And you have this peak on, of inflated in expectations, right? It's panacea, it will solve the world. It'll be the silver bullet to help with poverty. You then go, and I've been there, into the trough of disillusionment, where you realize, no, in fact, it won't save the world. And then you come to this, what. Gartner tends to call, or likes to call, the plateau of productivity. Uh, the alliterations abound here, um, which is where we need to be fast. That is, understanding what the limitations are, and understanding what the potential is, and not putting the tool before the bandwagon, so to speak. Uh, you know, agricultural pricing information is great if you don't, is great, if, but problematic or not enough if you don't have the road that actually allows you to bring the product to market before it spoils, right? So investments in basic health infrastructure and in basic transportation infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, are equally as important and the mobile phone isn't gonna do it. Um, so mobile money, I'm gonna skip this. It's a beautiful slide. Thank you to Amherst Shoemaker, who's a friend of mine who took this, uh, uh, $440 billion in remittances. I don't know whether you'll be talking about remittances, but personally, I am fascinated with this. So if you look at development and aid, it's a fraction of what remittances are. And remittances are still happening through extremely expensive Western unions. So can mobile money help us to actually streamline the remittance market, which is a much more reliable, and I would argue better, uh, uh, development or factor to increase GDP. In fact, it is a large percentage of GDP in many countries, $440 billion. And so can we make that cheaper to actually have more money go to families back home? You know, that would be one interesting area where I'd like to see work done. See gap. <laughs> um, to, to um, you know, sort of jumpstart some of the potential. Um, the other area that I have been extremely interested in is uh, data protection. So one of the things, obviously, that mobile, mobiles allow us to do is track people extremely efficiently and uh, effectively. Many governments do it. Your telephone company does it because it bills you, right? It knows where you are, who you call, who you SMS to, who calls you, 
what your patterns are, how long you're online, how much data you're transmitting, etc. In a development perspective, I find this extremely problematic, and there are very few people that are talking about this right now. Very few people. If you're gathering sensitive health data over completely clear text and insecure SMS, somebody's HIV status, sensitive information protected by HIPAA standards in this country, completely unregulated by development organizations, they don't self-regulate, by countries certainly that have, don't have any privacy or data protection uh, stipulations. And so you see the kind of ugly and dark underbelly, right? Particularly people who are in, at the bottom of the pyramid, seem to not deserve, by at least the lack of talking about it, um, any kind of data protections that mobile phones really warrant. We need this. If we are talking about mobile telephony and mobile phones in development, we need to talk about how do we protect that data that we're gathering, the information that we're distributing. Um, and so this is the work that I've been turning to much, and much more, and I get into the trough of disillusionment quite a bit. Um, so data protection and M4D is, I think, possibly my new passion, <laughs> among other things. Um, to that, um, just to conclude, the um, International Office of Migration at the UN, for the first time that I'm aware of, of a development organization, has actually put out a data protection manual, and kudos to them. You can download it, you can read it. It's a really good start. It's not perfect, but it's a very good start. And so, one of my anti-cautionary notes. Great work. We need much more of it. Thank you, Katrine. Now to carry on the conversation, we are going to turn over to Michael, who is going to talk a bunch about his work as well. And I think we'll start seeing more and more data as, uh, as the panel continues. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here representing the GAP group. I think is known to many of you, uh, Financial Inclusion and Resource Center housed at the World Bank. And uh, our goal is to uh, provide uh, financial services or to help promote financial services for low-income individuals around the world. Uh, historically, we've been involved in, you know, the, the quintessential micro loan, uh, the Grameen Bank, uh, Bangladesh uh, example, uh, but we have, uh, over the last uh, four or five years now, uh, been very much focused on branchless banking and the use of mobile and other technology uh, to provide access to financial services to low-income individuals around the world. And I've been focusing primarily on the policy and regulatory aspects of that. Um, I should start with a confession. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Um, I should have maybe a warning rather than a confession. Um, and it was funny because when I first heard the question, uh, you know, is mo are mobile solutions overhyped? I, I thought to myself, I remember in law school where they said, you can win any argument if you get to phrase the question. And so the easy answer to the question was yes, it's, it's overhyped if you're thinking that yes, uh, you know, mobile solutions provide direct and immediate alleviation of poverty, then yes, it's overhyped. But if we phrase the question differently, is there as much hope as there is hype? Is there room to be bullish? Uh, like Mora, who I agree with, uh, it's always good to agree with one of your donor members, USAID. Um, luckily, that was not uh, difficult to do. Um, but, uh, you know, if you ask that question, you'll find that the answer is also a resounding yes. Uh, one of the key uh, arguments uh, against sort of getting too excited about technology is, you know, you can't just give technology to poor people and expect that to change their lives if you don't address the literacy question that allows them to use the technology or the gender disparity that might prevent certain uh, women from, from getting that technology. You have to look at things in a cohesive manner. Uh, and I agree with that, but what that argument overlooks is that we're not giving new technology. That technology is already there. We have, uh, we've been talking a lot about the five to six billion number, how many people have mobile phones. But the number that CGAP is interested in is around 1.2 to 1.7 billion. And that is the number of uh, customers around the world who have mobile phones but do not have bank accounts. That's our target audience. And yes, it's not every poor person, it's not necessarily even the bottom of the pyramid, but it is a huge and significant number of people who have access to mobile services and not financial services, or at least formal financial services, and that's our target audience. Uh, so we're not talking about new technology. We're talking about technology that's already in the hands of 1.2 to 1.7 billion people, and we need to really be able to use that technology to provide financial services. Um, 
obviously, you know, we've talked about uh, M-Pesa, and but M-Pesa, you know, everyone says, oh, it's just a one-trick pony. You can't, you know, you can't replicate M-Pesa, and it's true. We are having difficulty finding more M-Pesas around the world, but you can't look at M-Pesa and deny the potential. Uh, of branchless banking. Uh, we have some very current figures. Just this morning, Governor Ndungu of the Central Bank of Kenya published a blog on the CGAP website in which he highlighted the most recent numbers. There are more than 18 million users of mobile money in Kenya, 14 million of which are just M-Pesa, another 4 million uh, are other uh, competitors that have entered the market. Um, that's compared to 15 million bank accounts. So if you just take a look at the numbers, in just four years, the mobile money solutions have been able to penetrate deeper into the market, have greater impact into the market than 40 years of the formal banking sector. You can't ignore that potential. Uh, 18 million users of mobile money out of a population of 41 million. Safe to say that the adult population is much smaller, so I think it's a comfortable figure to say more than half the adult population in Kenya relies on mobile money, uh, and, and that's uh, very difficult to, to ignore. Um, one of the other things that's really important to, to keep in mind is that this happened remarkably quickly. You know, for those who are saying, well, where are the results? What's the impact on poor people? If you think about the origin of payment cards here in the United States, you know, what we think, the Visa and the MasterCards in our pocket that we think have been around forever, well, they started in the 1950s with Diner Club and it, Diners Club, and it wasn't until 30 years later that people really started getting the traction out of mobile, pay, out of, uh, sorry, out of uh, plastic cards uh, here in the United States. It took an entire generation for that really to catch on. And yet we see in just four years in Kenya, given the right situation, the right circumstances, you can have a huge amount of impact very, very quickly. Uh, so the, yes, M-Pesa is an aberration in the sense that we haven't been able to replicate it, but it's an aberration in the sense that it was so successful so quickly, we would have anticipated that it would take much longer to reach these numbers. And so therefore we are, uh, as, our, as my colleague Mora, quite bullish uh, on mobile money. One thing I wanted to talk about, and, and um, it's just some numbers. We, you know, we asked ourselves at CGAP, you know, look, we, are we part of this hype? We don't want to, you know, really push this unless we've got some, some basic data. And so we asked ourselves, what has been the impact on poor people uh, of mobile money? And so we did a few surveys um, and research on nine mobile money applications around the world. I'm going to skip this first slide, which uh, is sort of just a background on, on how branches banking works, and we can get into that later if that's some sort of background that we need to all be on the same page. Um, but we, w some of the questions that we asked ourselves about customer adoption, the first one, does it really reach large numbers of unbanked, low-income individuals? And the answer, uh, we found that on average, 37 percent of mobile money users were previously unbanked. So the answer is yes, we are reaching poor people. The next was that half of these reach more than the average MFI in the microfinance institution in the same country. Um, so you know they have much greater outreach and penetration than the traditional microfinance institutions that have been operating for a much longer period of time. You know, Sasha, is it okay if I just sort of stand up there? Sure, sure. The next question we ask is, does it scale faster than traditional approaches to branchless, uh, traditional approaches to banking low-income people? And we discovered that yes, it does. And of course, in the case of M-Pesa, we saw that it took just three years to surpass the largest MFI, which had been operating for 15 years. So we do have not only a high level of penetration, but a much faster level of penetration. Another question we asked ourselves, is it cheaper than traditional bank products uh, that, than when those have also been aimed at low-income, unbanked consumers? Again, the answer was yes. On average, it's 19% cheaper than comparable bank services, and we are investigating remittances as well, and we hope to have more data for you on that level. Um, uh, but what's interesting there is that the lower the transaction value, the cheaper it actually is in comparison. So for example, if you're only sending $5, um, you know, your savings is going to be actually much higher than what you would normally have. So the, the lower you're actually transacting, which is typical of, of the low income users that we're targeting, the cheaper it actually is for them. And it's about half the price of informal options for money transfer. And you know this is really important because a lot of people are arguing. You know, look, you know, mobile phones are very expensive for poor people. Uh, you know, you can't say that this is such a great deal for them. Even mobile financial services are very expensive. You have to ask yourself relative to what. 
what are the options, the informal options they have available to them, for example, to send money. Uh, and what we've discovered is that regardless of the fact that they have to pay for these services, it is about half the price of their informal options. And those options usually include, you know, sending money with a friend or with a taxi driver. And, you know, it's interesting if you go online and you do and you see how they're actually uh, marketed uh, to their target audience, the security, the safety of sending the money is one of the uh, key components. That's the key driving message. Uh, I remember in South Africa, one of the radio ads was about somebody who sent money with a taxi driver and they drove so fast they went right past the house where they were supposed to deliver it and they never saw the money again. Those are the options that they have. So when we talk about the expense, you always have to talk about what their other options are, their expense compared to what. And the last question we asked ourselves was, what do the people really want from branches banking channels? And uh, that was primarily M-Pesa users. Um, and they want products that go beyond payments. And 21% of M-Pesa uh, users said that it's the most important instrument they have for savings. That's a little bit misleading, because really what the question said was, the one service they want that they don't have is interest on the money they keep in their account. So you're seeing that they really do look at this as a savings vehicle, and they really do look at this as a banking vehicle, and they actually want the same benefits they would get from a, a bank account. So I think that's very telling. One final point that I want to make, which I think is sort of a, a key obstacle to, to having branchless banking reach its full potential, is, is when we talk about non-bank e-money issuers. M-Pesa is is, uh, is, is produced by Safaricom, which is a mobile network operator. It's not technically a bank. Uh, and in very limited jurisdictions is that permitted. It is in Afghanistan, and we've seen some benefits from that. It is in the Philippines, um, you know, obviously in, in Kenya and uh, in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia. But, you know, it's a handful of countries that actually permit this model, which we see as having among the largest impact in the world. Um, and one of the problems is that when they let a mobile network operator be the, the issuer of the e-money, they say, well, you're not a bank, so we can't consider this money as deposits, so you can't pay interest on it, and it can't benefit from deposit insurance, which I think is really kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's, there's no real risk involved there in allowing interest to be paid, and, and CGAP has uh, actually promoted the idea that we really need to go from payments to <coughs> banking and to offer low-income users really the full array of banking benefits, such as interest and deposit insurance on these e-money accounts. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Michael. And now to bring up the end, <laughs> batting cleanup. <laughs> We have Kentaro, who's going to talk about a lot of his work. Oh, I already like the title. Brilliant. So I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Sasha. So uh, I guess I'm going to be the skeptic on the uh, panel. Um, I'm going to start. What did you say on the CNN thing? What was that? Yes and no, right? Actually, I said uh, it's overhyped, period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to start with a question. So I, sp I spent five years in India, and I tell everybody that the reason why I went was because I love Indian food. Um, what is wrong with this picture? So if you know, any of you are familiar with Indian food, on the left you see these uh, samosas, uh, which you find in stalls all over the country. Um, what do you think is wrong with this picture? Ketchup. ketchup, yes. So what is wrong with ketchup? Well, here's a country that had some of the most delicious <laughs> kinds of gravy, chutney, sauces you can imagine. And the thing that I was surprised to find when I went to India was that you go to any place that has samosas, and they will always give you a little packet of ketchup, right? The, what I think of as the blandest of condiments. Um, so, uh, you know, what I find is the interesting lesson behind it. You know, I asked lots of uh, Indian people why they want ketchup so much when they have all these other great options. And, you know, the thing that I think is the most reasonable answer was that a lot of people said, well, you know, um, ketchup is seen as a foreign thing that is exotic and therefore desirable, uh, you know, it's amazing. You know, Indian students will put ketchup on their pizzas, on their sandwiches. I mean, like, they'll dip their sandwiches in ketchup as they're eating it. Um, uh, and so it's, uh, it's interesting in that from a, you know, in one perspective, there's a different culture, right? So we might think it's strange that somebody who has lots of other great options should choose ketchup as their uh, condiment of choice. Uh, at the same time, it's very uh, it makes sense from the perspective that 
um, there is something interesting about exotic things. And what's exotic is different for everybody, but there's something universal about that idea that something is uh, interesting because it's exotic. So what I'm going to try to do is to talk about a similar kind of principle by which we can understand technology for development projects. It doesn't mean that all technology projects are necessarily good or bad. Uh, it just means that there's a certain way that you can uh, explain how projects work or don't work. Um, I, my background is that I am a computer scientist. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that as a technologist, I'm going to be the lone skeptic up here. But uh, I am a computer scientist by training, and I used to run a research lab in India for Microsoft, where we did uh, research into how various different kinds of information technologies could be used for international development. And some of our projects are up here. Uh, we worked in agriculture, education, um, healthcare, governance, uh, and so on. Um, and, of course, the reason why we went there was because there was actually a lot of promise and uh, optimism uh, around technology at the time. Mostly it was around the PC when I went there in 2004, but uh, it shifted while I was there towards the mobile phone. Uh, these are some quotes from people who are very prominent in this space. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that, uh, is that this is, th it's hype in a particular kind of way, and the best way that I can encapsulate what I think I learned over the last uh, seven or so years of doing this kind of research is that the easiest way to think of technology is that it amplifies the underlying human intent and capacity that is there, whether it's individual or institutional. Um, and it's very important that it only amplifies the human intent and capacity. And by, what, by that, what I mean is that it's not that technology is necessarily a net positive thing wherever you take it. In some cases, it might be net negative. In some cases, it might be net positive. In a whole bunch of cases, it will be net neutral with no strong contribution, positive or negative. And the way I'm going to try to illustrate this um, is through a series of uh, three questions, um, which uh, I'll start asking now. So the first one is, imagine you and a very poor rural farmer somewhere are given the task of raising as much money for the charity of your choice. Uh, and what you have to, uh, and the way you can do this is by, is through a single mobile phone to which you have unlimited voice and data access for a period of one week. Okay, so the question is, who would be able to raise more money? You or this very poor rural farmer somewhere in, let's say, uh, in Kenya. Uh, Kenya? So who thinks you? And who thinks the poor rural farmer? Okay, so this is a fairly shy audience, so I didn't see a lot of hands for either question. But, um, but most people who did raise their hand, raised their hand for themselves. And, and if you think a little bit about why that is, it's often because you have richer friends. Uh, you have a richer, richer social network, not virtually, but in person. Um, you also will tend to have a stronger education. Many people in this room have a great capacity to organize, do fundraising, and so on and so forth. Mostly things that a very poor rural farmer will not have any experience with. And so even though the technology is exactly the same, uh, the result is, is, is significantly different. And that's because, again, the technology amplifies that underlying uh, capacity that's there. Um, you can replace mobile phone with any technology. You can replace it with Facebook. You can replace it with the internet. You can replace it with email. You can replace it with uh, telegraph. Um, and the result will be the same. So this very idea that technology somehow counteracts uh, this phenomenon of the digital divide, I think, is uh, wildly um, uh, overhyped. Uh, basically, technology is multiplicative. So if there's an existing inequality socially and economically, that will tend to increase, even though it might be the case that everybody has some benefit and um, uh, the gap is increased. So next series of questions. I, I want everybody this time to start off with their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and lower them the moment you see a question for which you believe the answer is no. Okay, so the first question is, should members of the army have guns? Okay, most people still have their hands up. A few people seem to have lowered, okay? Uh, should police officers have guns? Okay, a couple of hands down. Should ordinary, sorry, should ordinary civilians have guns? Okay, should, should they, should they? Okay, um, quite a few hands went down. Okay, sh should five-year-old children have guns? Okay, all the hands went down. Uh, in some audiences, there's still some hands up at this stage, so I have to ask this last question which is, should convicted serial murderers have guns? Um, so the point here is that the technology is the same in all of these questions, but in the context that you imagine, it's either good or bad. And one thing that I think we tend to do in development all the time is to find a particular solution and find and 
cherry pick all of the positive things that we can find about it, right? This project worked out really great. This project was fantastic. This project was fantastic. Therefore, it must be the case that this thing is fantastic, whatever you do with it, or, um, or that it has that same potential everywhere you go. And I'm going to suggest that that is uh, not true, not just with guns, but with basically every information uh, technology that we've seen so far used in development. Uh, in particular, I'm going to illustrate uh, an example with television, which uh, in the 60s people thought was going to uh, change the face of education, not just in developing countries, but also in places like the United States of America. Uh, there were people then who were very bullish about television who thought that we could get rid of schools entirely because here's this device that not only streams audio, but video right into your living rooms. Why bother with having to go to school, that walking to school, all of that nonsense when you could just have educational content streamed right into your living room. Well, today we primarily think of television as a, uh, <laughs> as, um, a delivery channel for Snooki and other uh, options. I think most people who are here who are parents will limit in some way uh, their children's um, time with television. Uh, it's amazing how this transformation has happened. We've something that one, one generation thought was fundamentally positive could not do anything wrong and might even transform some things that are very hard to do. And today we think of it probably as a minor, minor evil. Um, so the important thing about technology is that it also amplifies whatever negative tendencies we have. In the case of television, it might have you know, very sleazy tendencies. Even the little bit that we might have gets amplified uh, by millions of viewers. OK, so finally, I want to get back a little bit more into the history of uh, information technologies. Um, in this case, I'm actually going to go through this fairly quickly because I think it's hard for people in the back to read. But basically, these are quotes from uh, various different documents by, written by people who were uh, technologists or technology supporters in their day, where I've left out the, let, uh, the technology uh, with the letter X. I usually ask people uh, what they think X is. And um, it's actually four different things. So at one point or another, cinema, radio, television, uh, and computers were uh, believed to be fundamentally revolutionary for uh, the classroom. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that this has been basically happening at a rate of about one per generation, possibly accelerating in hours. Um, Again, thinking about television, television has been fantastic. It does certain positive things. You can find great research that shows that there are certain positive social impacts that television has, uh, especially if you take it to rural areas. On the other hand, on the whole, we don't think of television as having fundamentally uh, changed uh, the face of poverty in uh, poor parts of the world. Um, so you know, one question is, uh, why do we keep having this very utopian vision of technology. And I, I'm not saying that technology is necessarily bad, just that it's value neutral and that the thing, it's not the deciding factor in whether good development happens. And the deciding factor is ultimately that underlying human intention and capacity. So um, if you look at, um, oops. If you look at uh, the kind of things that you read in the press in the United States about technology, it tends to hype what the technology does, right? So for example, you know, these are actual headlines. Twitter is changing the way we live. The internet democratizes access to information. Social networking will transform learning, and so on. All right, so uh, let's, think, let's look at the United States. Uh, this is a graph from the um, US Census Bureau. Uh, it shows the rate of poverty on the bottom, which has basically been uh, about 13%, a flat 13% or so since the 1970s. Uh, prior to the 1970s, it was actually declining uh, very consistently since about uh, World War II. Um, obviously, since the uh, recession, uh, that has gone up. Uh, I think the rate is now closer to 15 16%, depending on how you count it. The Census Bureau itself recently decided to uh, count a little differently. Um, in the same period of time, since the 70s, when we haven't seen any budge in the rate of poverty, we've had a virtual revolution in the information technology industry, right? So imagine, here's a country that is arguably the most technologically advanced country in the world. Uh, in its golden age of innovation, everybody has all of these technologies in abundance, and we haven't fundamentally seen a dent in the rate of poverty. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it's not, again, that technology is necessarily bad, but it's just not the deciding factor in, uh, co in solving very difficult uh, social problems. Uh, in this case, I think the explanation is reasonably uh, simple in the sense that it's basically that as a country, I think we've basically um, uh, kind of eased up on our desire to eliminate poverty beyond this point. And so, and it's interesting to, if you look at the history of, you know, what happened around the 1970s, all these different things all of a sudden stopped happening in the 1970s, and we've basically been cruising from that. The technology by itself hasn't been able to undo it. So it, 
you know, it puts to uh, question any conception of a technology-centric approach to development as the way to uh, alleviate poverty in the world. Thank you. Thank you all. So Kintara is saying price to earnings ratio is way too high. Sell immediately <laughs> <laughs> all your ICD for D stock. Um, I'm, I want to start actually with uh, this notion of technology is multiplicative uh, because it actually intersects with uh, a paper that I've very much loved uh, by Rahul Tongia and Ernie Wilson called The Dark Side of Metcalfe's Law. And I'd put that in originally our our slate editorial. I think they decided that was way too geeky and removed <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> but the notion was this. Metcalfe's Law in essence states that there's a network effect, right? The more people have access to something, say a telephone, the more useful it is to everyone that's on that network. And the internet and internet technologies are widely understood to be very similar, right? The benefits of having more people tweeting makes Twitter more beneficial to everyone else that's receiving those tweets. And what Tongi and Wilson say is, but there's a flip side of this, which is that if you're one of the people that's not on that network and not having the benefit of this exponentially growing positive effect, that you're facing a growing negative, right? That the discrepancy between you as not participating in this network and everyone that's on the network is growing. And so in essence, you're creating a new digital divide. The closer we get to 100%, the worst off those last few percentage people are. And of course, we know that certain constituencies, the poor and the rural especially, are systematically left out of all of these wonderful benefits. And so I'll start by asking the panel, you know, a lot of this is framed in terms of access and adoption. And I think intuitively we immediately can see how price is absolutely the number one barrier. Every piece of research I've seen has said that is the number one barrier to adoption. But it's not the sole barrier. And so I'd be curious about your thinking around what are the other barriers to getting those last few percent to benefit from these technologies? I'll, I'll start. I think there's a couple. I think there are cultural barriers. Um, it's particularly true for gender, but I just think there's cultural barriers that are. And, um, and I think that that's, I think it's M for D 1.0, which means that there's going to be some spectacular bankruptcies on the, uh, uh, on the field as well as some, uh, some uh, successes, some home runs. But I think um, it's because we're in this experimental phase to find out what are the killer apps, what are the must-have information um, um, that is coming across that is going to be a game changer in either civil society or in um, health or in ag or in other ways. So those are two. I, I, I was going to come back actually to the issue of cost, and cost is not an issue that's been solved, right? I mean, we, a long time ago, quite a number of years ago, um, a very visionary man named Steve Song um, and I talked about this over a few too many drinks probably, um, and we, we started talking about uh, we need a fair mobile index. That is, who is gouging? Which telco is gouging the poor the most? Right? Bottom line. So, so he's actually taking it further. I've turned to other things, but he has actually taken it further. And for, you can see it on his blog, there's sort of a bunch of different blog entries several years apart on Fair Mobile. Today, ICT uh, Research Africa is doing some significant and fabulous and wonderful research on the cost of mobile telephony, particularly for the poorest of the poor, and how much that constitutes of their disposable or not so disposable income. And in some cases, in some countries, up to 40 percent, right? Where for us, it's something like, God, maybe two or one or less. So, so this is not an issue that's been solved at all. Telcos are still gouging, because SMS in particular is the moneymaker for mobile operators, who are, after all, private venture commercial entities, um, you know, are still 
overcharging as far as I'm concerned when the fractional cost of an SMS is zero de facto. So, so you know, where we, if we're saying mobiles are so important for development and yet we're putting all our baskets, so to speak, in a very, ex in, in many ways, very, very expensive, <laughs> privately owned set of entities, I see a disconnect. I also just, you know, with all due respect, have a real problem with the killer app terminology. It's just that it just doesn't exist, right? There is no such a thing as the killer app, and I think the, the pursuit of that is a really futile one, and I think it also distorts the kind of conversation in a way that I don't think is particularly fruitful. Sorry, there you go. No, no, I, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the question of how do we get everybody to have a mobile phone in their pocket to me is a very different question from my perspective of how do we get those who already have a mobile phone in their pocket to use it for financial services and improving their lives. Um, we focus on that latter question at CGAP, and I think there's a lot of room to be optimistic about that and to suggest, you know, that, okay, how do we get the phone into the other sort of 20% to the people who are whoever, what percentage it is that doesn't have the phone, uh, to me uh, begs the question of, of you know, assumes almost that the people who have phones are making the best out of them and are being able to use every service that they can with them. So I would focus on that one to two to 1.7 billion that I quoted earlier that, that already have the phones in their pockets. But I, I wanted just to, 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 to address one of the points that Kentaro made because I thought it was a very interesting presentation. I think I can safely say I agree with everything in terms of technology as a basket but there's one point that I don't think you addressed in particular with respect to mobile phones, which are very different than the technologies you cited. Um, obviously, you know, TVs and Apple computers and even cars are outside the reach of most poor people. But mobile phones are quite different. They are sufficiently priced that they can be in the hands of lots of unbanked people. And that's that 1.2 to 1.7 number that I think that's a, a pretty uh, important distinction so that we don't lump all technology in the same basket. There's some very, very uh, uh, inexpensive technologies that poor people are using and can benefit from. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll first say that I think the way, speaking of the way questions are asked, is that Posing the question as one of the digital divide and having to close a digital divide either through access or through cost already is making an assumption about the kind of impact the technology is going to make. Um, you know, it's, it, we'll never close the digital divide as long as there is a social economic inequality. So what that means is, you know, this year it's the mobile divide. N last, in last year it was the PC divide. Next year it will be the tablet divide. In fact, that's already beginning to happen. Um, and the, who, who knows what comes next? Uh, if, if our goal is to ultimately close the divide, there is one glaringly obvious cause to the digital divide, which is the social economic one. You know, everybody in this room can afford uh, a fancy phone, and it's not because the phone allows you to do something special, it's because you already have a fantastic education, good social connections, et cetera, et cetera. Without those things, we can keep closing these digital divides one after the other, and um, the underlying situation will change. I mean, in fact, I think one of the great things about the world today is that, in fact, there are six billion uh, mobile phone accounts. You know, my hope is that when we get to about 6.5 billion, we'll start thinking, okay, not much is changing. Maybe we should rethink this whole idea, excitement around mobile phones. Although I would argue that vis-a-vis with, with -vis remittances, for example, right, you can reduce the cost to bring it into the realm of uh, you know, use the technology that exists at any given point. That is, you know, as in the case of mobile technology, the most ubiquitous right, communication. I agree. So, so, so you can, you know, actually lower cost of something that is extremely expensive now. Right. You know, where 10% of your remittance money gets stricken off the top, that doesn't get to the family, you know, in home country and from the diaspora. And so that's 10%. I believe that is that part of dollars it. is quite a bit. That <laughs> part is a great thing, and it's fantastic if you look at just the remittance aspect, right? But think about what Which happens. That's why I love it, because it's clean, right? Think it's about <laughs> what happens as mobile money becomes easier and easier, frictionless, uh, less and less costly. Basically, what you're doing is developing a pipe right into the wallets of the poorest, least educated people in the world, where th at the other end are very large corporations with savvy marketing departments <laughs> who know, already know how to sell to these people through Coca-Cola, things like that. Um, you know, one of the things I think is interesting, like, even with bank accounts, is this assumption that somehow not having a bank account is such a horrible thing in your life. Now, I agree there are many things that are good about being within the formal financial framework, but there are also lots of bad things, as I think the United States has you know, amply demonstrating the last couple of years. Um, and so it's not that the technology doesn't have good, good, good aspects, it's that if you always need to look at it in the whole. And on the whole, all, all what you'll find is that the technology, adding technology just reflects whatever tendencies are 
or do they're uh, in the institu- in, in human yeah. institutions. It's not very sexy, you know. <laughs> the killer app is way sexier. Well, <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I wanted to um, follow up on the killer app and just ask a question, but on this last one, because I can't help but say it, you know, I think just because there's been abuses doesn't mean just like because there's bankruptcies on the stock market, we should get rid of the whole thing. So I do think that we see evidence of how important resilience is at the bottom of the pyramid, and savings really does help resilience, and there's um, plenty of studies on that. So, So you're right. Getting a mobile phone um, that you can store money on doesn't in and of itself miraculously store money, but the evidence of um, the, the powerful effect of resilience on the bottom of the pyramid for savings is there. So, But I want to go back on the killer app because <laughs> I love uh, debates and I love uh, um, disagreement. So I'd be interested in knowing is it is that you are so um, opposed to that term because you don't believe that there will be killer apps at the bottom of the pyramid, or because you think in thinking that way and in characterizing it that way that we go down some wrong path. So I just it's, want to understand. It's the latter. It's okay. the latter. It's, the, it's this, this idea, which you know, I think it's the extension of the mobile phone will help us help you know, save the world, yeah. it's the silver bullet. OK, so we now reduce it one step, and now it's the killer app that will and global poverty, right? Or, uh, you know, increase yeah, global think, health. So, I so I don't think, because this is a complicated field, there's yeah. two things. T- development is really hard. Let's yeah. face it. Technology is really hard. It's very yeah. fast moving. And in some, in many ways, they're working at opposite ends. This focus on the killer app is, I think, an, an unuseful conversation to have because it takes away from the nuance, from the complexity, from the complicatedness, from the downsides. It may also take away, by the way, from the investments in the road, right, that brings the food to market, the product to market that, you know, somebody just figured out because they got access to market pricing information uh, on their mobile phone. Um, You know, it should be charged at a certain price, but it actually unfortunately spoils because the investment in the road and infrastructure hasn't been made. So, I'm, I mean, this is an, a question that I have for big development donors, right? Are we actually, because we're talking about all the, the killer apps, not looking at basic infrastructure investment that are, yeah, I, that, I are that are not yeah, sexy, that are not that int- interesting, yeah, and you know, they don't give you the headlines? By no means are we... Um, um, uh, uh, not paying attention to civil society and fair elections and infrastructure, whether it's w- clean water, whether it's electricity. But I do think that um, the killer app is a vernacular. I think it would be um, foolish to think that there is one silver bullet to development, just as there is one silver, uh, not one silver bullet to a happy life or uh, a, a graduate degree. But terminology on the degree. silver app. It's, it's, uh, Killer yeah, app I guess I guess I think of killer app as mass away. adoption, where the marketplace, in this case, the marketplace we care deeply about, is the people at the bottom of the pyramid. When there's mass adoption, I think that that's where you say they voted with their actions rather than what we think they should do, and so that's where I think we should be much more in the learning mode of what is those mass adoptions. Um, so I, uh, can, uh, I, can, I can tell you what those are, by the way. There already <laughs> are killer apps on mobile phones, and they tend to be entertainment and petty vices, like adult content. Uh, if you go to any, you know, any uh, peri-urban area in India, you'll find these little stores for, where for less than uh, one or two US dollars, you can get several gigabytes of, I see somebody nodding from India, you can get several Song. gigabytes of <laughs> video, of adult content, of music, everything that you could possibly imagine, load it onto that gigabyte of uh, micro SD RAM, and then you load it onto your phone, and that's what people want to hear. Um, you know, one of the reasons why development is hard is that, you know, human, we're all the same, right? You know, all of us, when, when we have spare time, we're not going to go and really study up that book on you know, electronic engineering because we always wanted to learn it. We're going to go and watch TV. I We're going to go and watch on YouTube. I don't think that's true. I think you look at, you know, and one can have an argument about for-profit universities, but you look at something like University of Phoenix, 300,000 people. You look at Open University in the UK. That is changing people's lives. Right. So It's different than going to the Ivy League schools, but so I, I don't know. I'd so be let a me, little let me, cautious let about me, let me saying that, that technology that enables... Um, stuff that doesn't actually make a difference. So let me suggest that that's true in an environment in which the society at large supports a culture of learning and where everybody is more or less guaranteed a reasonable education even before they get to college such that they have 
habits of studying, understanding that grades matter, and so on. If you go to many of the regions of the world where people are earning two US dollars per day per household and things like that, you'll find that the school system is in such a shambles that the children there have zero interest in learning. It's an uphill battle just to get them to I actually to think they do days. care about learning. It's just that there's a whole lot of obstacles It's not that they don't the care about learning. It. It's that the, ha the, the habits of what it takes to learn, which are hard for anybody, are even less there. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm more optimistic so for those kids in here. So I give you the counterexample, yeah. which is the, um, the BBC um, uh, <laughs> World Something Trust, whatever they call it. It's not the BBC. BBC World Service. Trust. trust right. Yes. BBC. Has a uh, program for learning English in Bangladesh, right? I think possibly supported by the BBC or by DFID or some donor, uh, you know, going through the roofs, a roof. It is the one of the most popular M4D applications we have seen to date, right? It actually has user adoption in the millions, right? People learning English on their mobile phones via a mobile channel, little lessons, you know, IVR type, you know, if you practice, you get feedback, etc. Super popular, super cheap, you know, vice services are extremely cheap in Bangladesh, completely popular. So there is a demand. People right. do well, want to learn. English gives you uh, economic opportunities. Et so now I think you're confusing the upper middle class in Bangladesh, which easily numbers in the several tens of millions, to the average person in Bangladesh who probably struggles to read in their own language. Can I Michael, back probably to some, true. some data. I mean, you know, a lot of this is, it's interesting because, you know, again, in law school, they taught us that if you have the facts, you know, you pound the facts. And I've tried to do that. And if you don't have the facts, you pound the table. And I kind of feel others have done that. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we put up some, <laughs> we, we, we put up some, some pretty interesting data up there uh, about how people who don't have access to financial services are using the mobile phone to get those financial services. And not only that, they want more financial services. And, and, and the regulators are the ones who are sort of standing in the way. So How do you address that? OK, I that's mean, easy. So you actually, don't have the one, you actually don't have the one kind of data that really makes a difference, which is out of the people who are using MPES on a daily basis, what is one measure of their actual welfare, n welfare, not their actual usage, but welfare that has shown an increase that is of sufficient magnitude that it makes a difference. It's um, a fair enough question. I mean, I, and I agree with that in the right? sense that we really do have to focus on the end game, which is, okay, have they gotten out of poverty? How has that impacted their exactly. welfare? So for example, the, prob you know, the, prob agree. the problem with these kinds of, any kind of data that shows usage is that you're uh, falling into the fallacy of what's called the market test in economics, yeah. which is basically that just because people do buy it, somehow it's making them better off. Right. Um, and that's fundamentally one of the things that doesn't routinely happen, you know, even in regular life. You know, okay. it's not clear to me but that my, you know, entertainment choices are necessarily making me better off, even though I spend money. Fair enough, but would you say that we should still at least be in the business of helping them make those decisions and being able to at least save money where they like can and have access to certain services? I or or I would, I is would that not enough way. for you? I mean, wouldn't that be a first I, I, step? So I would put it this way. So I think the real question is, so, you know, I, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, Maura mentioned this earlier, but I want to make sure that I don't come off as saying that I'm anti-technology in the sense of we have to get rid of it. Uh, I am not <laughs> no. that, okay? <laughs> However, the interesting thing about technology is that there's a great private sector industry that is pushing as hard as it can to get this stuff out there anyway. So the real question is, do we want to spend public funds and donor funds so as to help these private sector companies that are going to do it anyway, do it even faster? And I think if we're going to use public funds for anything, it should really be for attending to the human intent and capacity side. Mm -hmm. So for in, the, in the case of financial inclusion, I would say, you know, let's spend all of this money that you guys are trying to figure out how to get the technology right. Look, the companies will figure it out. Instead, let's spend it on well, financial we're education. We're not trying to get the financial. technology right. We are trying to. There's $750 million sitting in um, country accounts that are universal service funds to extend the um, cell uh, network to outside of the areas that's profitable for them now. That's sitting in bank accounts not used. We're interested in helping countries figure out how to use that in a smart way. So I do think that it's important, at least from my perspective, that one be careful about what characterize, what the, uh, what's being characterized as what the development agencies are funding or aren't funding. We're not funding putting a mobile phone in everybody's hand. We're not uh, um, uh, 
of of funding um, just the diffusion of technology. We are focused on is there access at the bottom of the pyramid or in more rural areas. Much like, frankly, we made a decision in the U.S. to extend electricity to the farms in the U.S. when it wasn't a profitable thing, and that has been enormously um, valuable. So, um, so we can disagree on whether um, M for D is overhyped or, or worked, but I do think we need to be careful about characterizing what we are and are not spending money on. Sure. So let I, I let mean, me jump in here real quick. So we're going to turn it over to you guys <laughs> for <laughs> questions. I have like eight like here. I've gotten through one. one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm going to switch switch the topic a little bit uh, because there was there was a a data point that Michael brought up that really intrigued me, which was this M banking being 19% cheaper than comparable bank transfers or bank services. And on the one hand, I thought, like, this is great, right? I mean, 20% cheaper is a good thing. On the other hand, if I was like, the Visigoths pillage 19% less than the Vikings, we'd probably say, like, we should probably stop pillaging. Are you comparing bank accounts to pillaging? <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that the resource extraction from the poorest of the poor is incredibly high, mm -hmm. and that the business models behind this really are sort of the long tail of resource extraction. And so my question is just, what are the responsibilities of businesses, the telcos on the one hand, regulators on the other, to look at how, because there's a percentage of people's disposable incomes, the amount that the poorest of the poor are paying is incredibly high. I'm, I'm a little bit taken aback by the question because I, it's the first time I've come into a, uh, to an environment where it seems as though access to financial services is actually a bad thing for poor people or could be a bad thing for poor people. And I guess I don't mean to sound naive. I obviously am well aware of, of how the microcredit sector has uh, matured over the years and how there have been definitely some, some problems along the way, particularly in, in India uh, over the last year. Um, but uh, I, from, from our angle, we take our cue from what, what our target audience tells us they want. And when we talk to them and say, what is it you need? What are your services? What are the services you need? Why do you need that money? How do you use that money? Uh, and you know, what services are you lacking? And very early on, we discovered that they want to be banked, but the key obstacles were there was no bank in their area, or it was too expensive. You had to have a minimum amount in your bank account, or you had to pay a monthly fee for your bank account. And we see that here in the United States. And we almost had to pay a fee just to use our debit card not too long ago. Um, so it was ex too expensive, it was, and it was too far away. Um, and mobile banking overcame those two chief obstacles. Uh, and that's why they used it. Did I not answer your question? No, I, th okay. I think I was, <laughs> as far as it goes, I think we're actually in agreement. I'm saying, you know, do we now declare mission accomplished or is there something next? Like, are we still not, like, because to, to me it seems like even with mobile banking, we still have a problem. It's not as bad a problem as it was before. Sure, sure. And, and there's, I, I there's, did you want to get in there? Yep. Okay. I mean, I think there's always, I mean, is this the panacea? Is this the one thing that's going to have direct and immediate alleviation of poverty? Will this reach everybody? No, if they don't have a mobile phone, uh, it's not going to reach everybody. But again, we get back to that 1.2 to 1.7 billion that we're focused on, which have that mobile phone and can use that mobile phone to access financial services that they don't already have. Right. So my question was, what are the responsibilities then of the telcos or regulators to, to do what's next, right? If this is where I we are today. I do think consumer protection. I, I completely agree with the concern about data privacy and um, like we're just beginning to really understand and pay attention to that as a society, I mean, not on mobile phones. So, uh, so I do think that that is huge. So I think that uh, rather than regulate prices, I think um, protecting consumers on privacy, on scams, on all sorts of things is pretty critical as this mobile revolution begins to develop. All right, do we have a microphone ready? Let's go right here to the front. It's the benefit of coming up front. Uh, thank you very much for a very dynamic and uh, and at times um, I thought people were going to come to fisticuffs there for a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I was I was hoping you were going to come to fisticuffs. You don't understand. <laughs> we need some entertainment here. <laughs> um, to the point of the billions of people that have the. Uh, access, uh, as you're pointing to, Michael. Uh, I'm really interested in 
the possibly looking at public-private partnering with banking institutions that could be providing uh, the service uh, and then the people could get interest for their money and at the same time it'd be a structure in which the funding could be put could be uh, tap uh, uh, accounted for because this is a big problem uh, I've seen in development over the last 20 years uh, lack of accountability it's very difficult uh, to deal with the accountability issues and this would be you know the old saying follow the money mm -hmm. so this would be a way of following the money at the same time uh, providing the very point you were making would you is that do you see that so the question is how feasible is such a, a potential structure to be pursued? It, it, it's quite feasible and it's actually what's happening now. As I mentioned earlier, it's only a handful of countries that allow non-banks to actually engage in this. Most of them require that you have a bank partner who is the one who's technically licensed and responsible to the end consumer for that financial service. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, the more people you have in there, the more difficult the business model becomes and the roles they play and, and you know, how do they cut the profit and there's more hands to, you know, to have to hand over some profit to. Um, so it does become a little bit more complicated, but not to say, um, you know, that it's not as effective in Pakistan right now it is that bank model as far as I know they are permitted to pay interest on those accounts um, I don't know that they do but they are permitted to uh, and uh, Pakistan is one of those countries where it's about to sort of enter that second generation of payment systems where they start becoming interoperable we hope and then that could really cause uh, the system to take off so I'm going to take three questions in rapid actually it looks like there's three right over here so we're going to take these three please be pithy We'll let you guys answer them, you, anyone you want. Sure. At, at the macro level, there's a lot of talk about, you know, increasing in uh, mobile infrastructure having an impact on GDP in, you know, in various countries. And so looking at, you know, poverty through that lens. Um, and so just uh, wanted to get your thoughts in terms of the causal relationships. You know, are these studies well-structured, well-designed? Um, and is, is that the, the entry point, and is it not you know, necessarily just through the individual types of development-ish activities that are going on? And we were actually talking about this earlier. As, let let as me get these three As we're going on, though. So oh, here. Three questions. Sorry, no answer. This gentleman. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Get back to you. Okay. Um, my question, I mean, I just want to relate a small you know, story, uh, because we are talking about macro a and a macro small level. Story? Short. Yeah, it's a sh very short, like not story, story, but like a situation. <laughs> like because, you know, we are talking about can mobile phone end global poverty. And I think uh, I worked in the tribal area in India long back and I saw a woman. I was very impressed. Like she was a tribal woman, but uh, she had developed a nursery and uh, she was making money and she was going to the women's development, um, women's conference in Beijing. And she went to the district collector to ask him to take care of her family. Now, because she was so empowered, she could go to the district. But the way I see is if she had a mobile phone, she could actually talk to her family on a daily basis and make sure that her children are going to school. Or So I, I do think that the, the impact that mobile phones can have at that level is not, we are not seeing in the larger discussion because similarly about health, a lot of women in India don't even have access to doctors. They can't even talk to doctors without the consent of the male partner or the you know males of the family. They, it becomes a family issue even if you have to go to the doctor. So I think having access to mobile phone to be able to talk to another woman or a doctor uh, who's a woman can you know greatly benefit and um, and so I, I do think that you know um thank you for that and then this gentleman right here and then we'll go back to the panel uh, okay uh, I'm Neil Murphy and I uh, I work for the U.S. Treasury and I should say that uh, what I'm s what my views do not necessarily <laughs> represent those of the U.S. <laughs> Treasury uh, I find uh, some of this uh, First of all, I think there's a little bit that Mike Tarazi left out in terms of the success of the MNO, and that is it's the MNO agent model. And the cost savings come from the fact that the agent is very low cost. And in Kenya, they now have a, a regulatory environment that allows the banks to have agents as well. 
which is probably what it should be. I'm very concerned about uh, uh, infrastructure. And payment system infrastructure is an area that I work a lot in. And, and if, if it's not an m and if it's just a regular bank. Well, network operator. Well, so yeah, not yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Acronym land. All right. Um, <laughs> that's running the, the uh, delivering the service where the, the liability is that of the phone company, um, then I see that this is no different than the ATMs or internet banking. It's just another technology. And the way the financial infrastructure works for payment systems is, is that there's uh, central counterparties and, and that there's a competitive structure where the central, where qualified competitive producers access the central counterparty which allows, and that's now going over cross-border as well. Uh, I can basically st uh, pay people in Europe over the ACH. So what concerns me is that is among other things that there's no um, that the the, the M and O is basically running a systemic payment system, systemically important payment system in Kenya. Outside, uh, even though the central bank does watch it, mm -hmm. it's outside the normal infrastructure and. Um, I think that's, that, that could be a problem over time. And, and also, to suppress the question of risk management, I'm also very concerned, as other people are, about consumer protection, deposit insurance, a um, couple of other things as well, but I've talked enough. So Great, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I can definitely tell you work for Treasury. <laughs> uh, also, tele telco communication. There you go. All right. Being a regulator. Yeah. So he here's the three. We've got impacts on GDP and the causal relationships between these technologies and GDP. You have the on-the-ground empowerment that women in particular, but I think many other constituencies feel from these technologies in their everyday lives. And you've got the notion of risk management, consumer protections, the notion of we don't want another bailout kind of scenario if things go awry because there's no oversight of these systems in the same way that there are over banks. So um, I think I, I can address the first two kind of in uh, one shot. So uh, to answer Patty's question about in macro level. So you know, in economics, there's this thing called the Cobbs-Douglas Cobbs function, where you basically they say productivity is the product of financial capital, human capital, and technology. I think they're missing energy in there, but that's a separate story. Um, and so basically, if you leave out the financial capital and hold that steady, it comes down to technology multiplies human capital. Uh, and at that point, I go back to, okay, so what should public funds, donor funds, and other funds that aren't going to be invested by the private sector, what should they be focusing on? Well, the private sector hates to invest in human capital. So I believe that's the side that needs to get more attention whenever possible. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, anytime you have a multiplication, you get the greatest gains when you're kind of, you're using the resources in such a way that you end up with a square, right? So you know, in environments where the human capital is very, very low, and in the case of information technology, human, ca uh, human tech, uh, capital in the form of education is the critical factor, you need to expand that side dramatically before the technology becomes uh, useful, which is not to say that it's never useful, just that that's the, that should be the emphasis. And I think a similar thing I would say for the micro-level empowerment, which is what you're talking about is exactly the, you know, a situation where the technology amplified this woman's overall ability. The real problem is not that everyone doesn't have a mobile phone. The real problem is that not everybody is like that woman. If you could get that, if you could get that, if you could get that change to happen, then you would have to worry less about the phone. But we don't want the whole society to be the same. I mean, everyone has different needs. No, I'm not saying that they all need to be the same, but ideally they would have the same, you know, educational opportunities, right? That that some level of human capital is built up beyond, you know, beyond uh, what's Re, you know, reasonably necessary to live and uh, have a, you know, have a good job. No, I mean. Well, let, let's let's yeah. move on. But this is a perfect discussion to have once we close out. Uh, so <laughs> let, let me go to Katrine, Michael, Mara, if you want to. No, the take only us point that I would make, in addition to what Kintara said, was uh, that in many countries, the mobile, the telco sector is actually the largest employer in the country. So there are. There are, you know, some interesting economic benefits. That is not to say that the jobs the telco sector uh, produces, agents, namely, uh, you know, are great jobs or extremely high-paying jobs, but they do contribute significantly to, 
you know, the, the GDP in a, in a variety of different um, ways. Although I don't think, I haven't seen any recent studies, and, and Kentaro was mentioning that the, the uh, earlier study, who was it, Wine, what? Waverman. Waverman was, uh, was somewhat uh, um, compromised in terms of its methodology. Um, and so I think there would be, it would be really interesting to do a, a little more rigorous research on, the, on that area. Um, as on the social cohesion and the, the, the issue around women in particular, that there's very recent um, women research, ethnographic research, that is actually showing the exact same thing. So it's brand new, just off the presses, and will be released in full at the Mobile Congress in Barcelona in a couple of weeks, in a week. Um, that shows, you know, the, the, for particular women at the bottom of the pyramid, the, the uh, sort of safe social safety net that is often the only safety net that exists is actually critically enhanced by mobile telecommunications because it allows women, you know, often sometimes against the wishes of their male uh, partners to be able to build relatively cheaply kind of a social network and a, and a, a you know, connective tissue, if you will, that allows for some degree of safety net, insufficient as it may be. Michael Mora? If I could just address the question from the gentleman from Treasury. Um, you're absolutely correct. I mean, this definitely relies on agent banking in a way as well, because, uh, and this was the slide that I flipped through very quickly, unfortunately, but, you know, the basic model is that these poor people don't have access to a, a bank in their neighborhood, so the mobile network company or the bank, uh, whoever's providing the service, is contracted with their local butcher, baker, pharmacist, um, and that's where they go on a daily basis, and that's where they use for their cash-in and cash-out function, a bit like a human ATM. And that's exactly why you're lowering the cost. The bank doesn't have to build a bricks and mortars branch, um, and uh, you know, and so therefore they're able to to save expenses uh, in that way. Um, but. One of the things, though, that I have to stress is that even when a mobile network operator like Safari Common and Pesa is the provider of the service, in all cases where that is permitted, there is still a bank or several banks involved. Um, M Pesa doesn't take that money and put it in their working capital account. They have to put that money 100% banked into the prudentially regulated financial institutions of that country. So, uh, and that's where that money has to be held so that it's always protected to the extent any deposits are protected. And as uh, Kintara pointed out, we didn't do so well here in the United States. Um, but it, it then, uh, and then it's just a question of how you extend deposit insurance um, to those accounts. You, we have a great example here, and I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, you know, uh, the opinion eight from the FDIC that allows pooled accounts, and I want to get into the details, but, you know, I would love to see that uh, be extended to some of these other pooled accounts that we see uh, in, in uh, in mobile network, uh, mobile payment schemes. And then just lastly, in terms of systemic importance, as I said, it's already in the prudentially regulated system. Um, but the amount of money that transfers that goes through this um, is not deemed systemically important uh, by uh, the regulators. For example, in Brazil, uh, they think it's about 16% of all money is going through agents. And yet they don't consider that to be systemically important to go actually out and, and supervise those agents. Uh, and, and we have a new uh, publication on that as well, but we can talk more uh, afterwards. It's my understanding we're um, wrapping up, so I'd just like to say that I think this has been um, um, pithy and interesting, and despite the fact that we may not have all agreed, I think it's a very timely and important conversation. So hats off to my um, panelists and to the New America Foundation for hosting this. Thank you. So I hope you all stick around. If you have other questions for the panelists, I hope you guys will stick around if you're able to. And please join me in thanking them for coming up here and giving us a great, great panel. <laughs>